Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for joining us. I am Caroline Taylor. I'm the director of R&D for Earthshift Global, and I'm really pleased to welcome you to the February uh, Brown Bag webinar. Today, we have the privilege of hearing from Anne-Marie Belay, which is very exciting. Anne-Marie has been and continues to be a major force in advancing how we uh, handle water use in LCA. She's currently the chair of the NFC Tech Water Use and LCA Working Group and FAO's Water Footprint Group and Scientific Coordinator at CERAG. Today, she's going to talk to us about the consensus building process behind a lot of these activities. Uh, before we get started, a couple of bookkeeping notes. This webinar will be recorded. It'll be available um, online shortly after the webinar. Uh, I will coordinate questions, so if you will send questions to me via direct chat, using the, the chat client within Ring Central, I will collate them and we'll ask them at the end. And now, without further ado, Anne-Marie, thank you so much. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I will just share my screen. Please let me know if this is fine. That looks great. Perfect. Thank you. Welcome to this webinar. It's a pleasure for me uh, today to present you with the AWARE methodology as well as water scarcity footprint introduction. The plan for today's webinar, I will start with the evolution of the water footprint concept and uh, which led to the development of the ISO 14046 standard on water footprint. I will then follow with the water scarcity footprint specification and then the development of the AWARE methodology and as much information as I can give you on this method. Perhaps as a reminder, if everybody can keep themselves muted, it might uh, help avoid distracting noises. Thanks. So you can might have heard of water... Hold on yes? just a second. I think people are having... are not able to hear much of the webinar. Uh, Okay, I can wait. Give it just one moment. Let's give them sure. a second to see if they're able to fix it. Um, and then we'll go ahead and get started. Okay, we have confirmation that other people can hear everything, so we're going to go ahead and keep going. Thank you, Anne-Marie. Sorry about that. No problem. So you may have heard of the water footprint concept already for quite some years, and it first started as an approach uh, which was led by the Water Footprint Network with the terms blue water, green water, gray water. And it was really a volumetric approach, uh, which we can also call virtual water, which summed all the water that was consumed all along uh, the supply chain and the production of specific goods. Blue water referred to the water present in rivers and lakes, as well as groundwater, whereas green water refers to um, the rainwater that was used by plants and received uh, directly from rain and used at the spot where it fell and gray water as a hypothetical dilution volume with respect to regulation. Um, so this was the first concept, and um, some example led to values such as a cup of coffee having an equivalent of, let's say, virtual water or water consumed in the supply chain of 140 liters, for example. This was really good to raise awareness about the importance of the water resources and everything that is uh, embedded in or activities and the objects that we use that we may not be aware of, of all the water that has been consumed along the way. As awareness was raised, then different methodologies emerged, and the same cup of coffee could be also assessed in different ways with new methodologies. For example, Humbert and Al assessed a volume of 4 to 29 liters of water consumed, depending on irrigation rate, and this did not include um, some pollution aspects in this case, really as water consumption. And then another methodology that was put forward by the French labeling uh, was putting forward that for a same cup of coffee, it was actually 0 0.3 liters equivalent, where in this case, we'll see scarcity was taken into account when accounting for this consumption and these equivalencies. So with all these different values coming up, there was a need for consensus and harmonization, and who best to work on harmonization but the International Standard of Organization, ISO. So the proposal was put forward and the standard um, 
started to be developed in 2009 in order to standardize the way that a water footprint would be performed. It was a five-year process, which led to the uh, ISO 14046 standard um, environmental management oops, principle requirements and guidelines. And in this standard, um, the definition of a water footprint is a metric that quantifies the potential environmental impacts related to water. So here the term potential environmental impact is really important and as most of you must know, directly relates to the foundation of LCA. So the main concepts in the standard is that a water footprint should be life cycle based. Um, it could be done as a standalone metric, so simply a water footprint or as part of a full life cycle assessment. The results of the water footprint should include impact assessments, hence uh, volumes would not be sufficient for, uh, be for the standard and to be called the water footprint. And hence, it should address regional issues. This is what is normally performed in the impact assessment phase for water use. Both the quantity and the quality should be considered in the impact assessment phase. And as well, all the impact assessment related to water should be considered. This meant that not only the water use, but all the impacts related to water, because you may be affecting water quality, for example, by air emissions, even though you never actually touched the water yourself. So it was really meant, it is really meant to be a broad uh, quality indicators. So of course, the result can be one or several indicators, very similarly to an LCA profile, you may have a water footprint profile. So as much as in LCA, uh, you have this framework with midpoint and endpoint, the water footprint is really an extract of an LCA where you would look only at the water-related impacts, with mostly at the midpoint category, such as, as uh, human toxicity, aquatic ecotoxicity, acidification, eutrophication, but as well water scarcity. And all of these could be transferred to damages on the areas of protection specifically human health and ecosystem at this point. So these impact categories um, on water quality have already been integrated and assessed in LCA for quite some time. So this is not where the most innovation could be made for methodologies, nor where the most consensus was needed. But in terms of water scarcity, the problems, the problems and damages from water uh, quantity aspects were only integrated in LCA um, in 2009 for the first time and, and there was still much development and consensus to be achieved there. So another way that I like to present the different types of water footprint, uh, often for industrials who like to start small, is that really the smallest version of a water footprint could be seen as a water scarcity footprint, in which case you really only assess the impacts associated with the reduced water availability caused by consumption. And if you wanted to go a little bit broader and include a little bit of quality aspects, you could do what the standards call the water availability footprint, where in this case, you still only assess impacts associated with reduced availability, but taking into account the fact that a lower quality of water may reduce the availability. Hence, here we're not talking about direct impacts from emissions on toxicity, but just the fact that uh, water must be of a certain quality in order to be available to specific users. Then in order to perform a complete water footprint, you would have to integrate both a water availability or scarcity footprint, as well as a water degradation footprint, which then considers the direct pollution impacts from the like, say, traditional categories, eutrophication, acidification, toxicity, and human toxicity. But we have to keep in mind that this is still a limited concept because it's a footprint and only looks at water. And if you really want to be comprehensive, of course, you should do a full LCA. But what an LCA is really is the combination of a water footprint, a, car a carbon footprint, as well as other remaining footprints or impact categories. But the topic of today's webinar is about the water scarcity footprint, which is a bit the newer, the newer kid on the block. So you would calculate the water scarcity footprint simply by multiplying your inventory of water consumed, which could be consumed because it was evaporated it was integrated into a product, or it was transferred to another watershed or released into the sea. 
the idea is that really this water is no longer available for the users that are within this specific watershed. Watershed is normally taken as the most relevant scale for water scarcity assessment. Could be watershed, could be sub-watersheds, um, country level, we'll discuss a little bit that later. Maybe, maybe too broad, it is too broad in most cases. And, and there's a limit to which um, going smaller would not make much sense hydrologically. So you have this uh, inventory of consumed water, typically in cubic meter, which you multiply by a scarcity index, typically in cubic meter equivalent by cubic meter consumed, which gives you your water scarcity footprint in cubic meter equivalent. But what really is the scarcity index? So originally, when we started to integrate scarcity in LCA, we started with indicators that were based on the ratio of how much water is withdrawn in the region, namely a watershed, versus how much uh, is available uh, on, in this watershed, normally renewable water available. Then uh, we realized that actually a lot of the water that is withdrawn can be put right back into the environment if it's used for cooling water, for, for example. And, and when you do uh, this extraction of water and you put it back in the environment, you have not contributed really to the local scarcity because this water is still available at least shortly after to the local users. So then the ratios evolve towards more of a consumption to availability ratio. In the case where consumption really only refers to the fraction of water that is no longer available in the watershed because it has been consumed. Then when we started the work with Wilka, which I'll explain a bit more how this got started, um, we started uh, asking ourselves what kind of indicators exactly we wanted to develop. And the fact that we wanted to include ecosystem uh, needs and potential damages, we thought at first to go towards ratios of demand to availability. So simply including the ecosystem water requirements or ecosystem demand, as well as the human demand in the ratio, and doing this ratio over availability. And then we went around on different workshops and consulted with experts, and something that came out was that, I don't know if you can notice in these maps, um, some places that we know are water scarce, such as the Sahara, don't come out as the most water scarce. And the reason for that is that when you have a ratio like this, you may know that, for example, half of your water available is being withdrawn, consumed, or demanded, but you have no idea if this meant one meter cube or 10,000 meter cube. So you don't actually don't have any information about the absolute availability, only about the relation between the demand and the availability. And in the case of LCA, where we may want to assess potential impacts of additional water consumption in a specific region, we also needed some information about whether there is a lot of water or not in this region. So this is how um, the concept evolved towards a difference between availability minus demand, which is, let's say, the foundation under the AWARE methodology, which is the WUCA recommendation. So to explain a bit more how this project came about, so there's the unep CTAC Lifecycle Initiative, which was putting forward a flagship project in order to provide guidance on specific indicators and specific categories. And the way that they first chose which categories would go first in order to build their consensus, they also went through a workshop and asked which categories um, was desired to start with, either because they were mature enough and had been around in LCA for long enough, or because there was such pressure from stakeholders that there was a need to have consensus on this methodology. So water use definitely uh, belonged to the second of these reasons. Not that water scarcity was assessed for so long, but there was such a need to have consensus and to have one indicator that people could use and then compare their results that uh, water scarcity was then uh, chosen. And WULCA, which is the Water Use and LCA Working Group of the Life Cycle Initiative that was founded in 2007, had already been working on comparing the methods and uh, looking at specific developments and frameworks, then WULCA was mandated in 2013 to build the consensus in order to have one water scarcity methodology. And all of this was going to come together and emerge from the final Pelston workshop that was going to be held um, two years later in Valencia, in Spain, uh, in this case in January 2016. 
So we worked for two years in order to bring a deliverable to the workshop where the consensus could be finalized. And the status was that AWARE is recommended because there was different ways that uh, this, there could be different outcomes out of this uh, workshop. So the status is that AWARE is recommended. The, there's already the report out from the Lifecycle Initiative. Concurrently, uh, GRC, so the Joint Research Center of the European Commission, was working on updating the methodology recommendation for the PEF, the Product Environmental Footprint. And uh, they also updated the recommendation such that AWARE is recommended as a methodology for the PEF. And you can find the latest paper of this methodology online. The process um, was really not just uh, from my side. We were a group of 14 people. I was leading this group from, uh, as you can see, uh, Europe and North America, uh, so from Japan. And uh, we worked for two years with several meetings. And there was also, as I mentioned at the beginning, different experts uh, consulted in different workshops. The first one was in San Francisco, then the second one in Zurich, and the third one, or the second one in Japan, and the third one in Zurich. And in these workshops, we were testing the decisions that we were making to make sure they was making sense, both with LCA experts as well as uh, uh, water expert, hydrological expert, etc. And then towards the end, we also uh, ran some stakeholder survey on, on some uh, specific choices, namely one normative choice that we had in the methodology regarding the cutoffs, uh, which I will explain later. This was also um, ran through the stakeholder survey in order to see what, what was also seen acceptable or not when it comes to making a choice that actually is uh, less scientific. And there's actually three publications. There's two that describe the process at different stages, and then the last one that describes the methodology. So for this method, uh, when we first started, we had to locate ourselves on the framework of LCA and specifically of water use in LCA, of what we were aiming at. We were really asked to develop the water scarcity or stress-based uh, midpoint, which meant that if we were going to be generic, we were aware that this specific indicator was not going to be directly connected to an uh, endpoint indicator, neither on human health or ecosystems, but was going to be generically representing both potential damages on either or. But when you try to be generic, then you cannot be specific uh, on, on either of them. So uh, knowing this, we set forward to develop uh, a stress-based or scarcity-based generic midpoint. And the first thing we did is ask ourselves which question we were trying to answer. Because when we were comparing all these different water scarcity indicators and we looked at the fact that they all had some slight differences, we realized that the differences were at the source of the fact that they tried to answer different questions. Some of them were more uh, human use oriented, some of them are more environmental oriented, um, or some of them were more absolute availability or aridity oriented. So in our case, because we were set in within the frame of LCA, the questions that the question that we wanted our indicator to answer was what is the potential of depriving another user of water, whether this user is human or ecosystems, when you consume water in this area. And with this, this is why we included both human consumption and environmental uh, water requirements. So the characterization factor is really a function which is based on the inverse of uh, available water remaining. And available water remaining stands for, um, well, it's, it's the acronym for AWARE, or AWARE is the acronym for available water remaining. And um, it really is based on the availability minus demand or what we will call in this equation, for simplicity, AMD. Um, the underlying assumption of this methodology is that the more water remaining you have per unit area, the lower the potential to deprive another user. That's really, uh, has to be clear that that's what the model is based on. The more water you have remaining after the demand has been met, both from human and ecosystem perspective, then the less potential you have to deprive other users when you consume water in this area. So more specifically, this AMD is calculated as the availability, uh, so renewable availability minus human consumption, minus ecosystem needs uh, per meter square per month. We chose really the monthly scale as it is much more relevant than the annual scale and still a manageable scale. 
and uh, the per area was only to be able to uh, normalize the large watershed versus small watershed in order to assess really the, uh, the availability per unit area. But then uh, it's actually not a one that you have on top of the equation, but it's uh, a constant. And this constant represents the world average of all the AMDs, of all the watersheds, of all the months in the world. So this value is 0 0.0136 cubic meter world equivalent per meter square per month. And the reason we did this um, was to simplify uh, in one way the communication. And we could have chosen different references. We could have chosen uh, Amazon equivalent meter cube or a Sahara e equivalent meter cube. We just thought that the world was more general, but that wouldn't change anything. It's really just a reference, really in the same way that carbon uh, CO2 uh, plays the role as being the reference in carbon footprint. So it's really just an equivalent to facilitate the comparison and the communication of the value. So in terms of units, the units of the characterization factor, therefore, are cubic meter world equivalent per cubic meter of water consumed in a specific region. And then we have set this equation boundaries between 0 0.1 and 100. So cutting off the tailing values in order to avoid having really huge impact of 12 orders of magnitude for a few uh, extreme cases. And hence, this is the cutoff choice that I mentioned, um, that is the normative choice which was consulted with experts. So if I show you the results, uh, here you have the maps for where for all the sub-watersheds, watersheds, sub-watersheds, 11,000 in the world for January, and then we'll just advance them uh, from month to month. And we have calculated those on a monthly basis, but in order to um, ensure applicability in LCA, there is also a need to calculate an annual value as well as country values. So of course, the easy way we can think of to calculate an annual value out of the 12 months is to do a generic average of the 12 months, a normal average, um, in order to obtain one annual value. And we did that. This is the equivalent of the annual value of a wear. However, we recommend this for non-agricultural use, meaning that if you know you are irrigating, even if you don't know in which month, having just a normal average over 12 months will not represent well the most likely month of when you are irrigating. So this is really an annual value because it's a normal average over 12 months that would represent a constant water consumption. Uh, so either domestic use or industrial use in most cases. So we have also provided a different kind of average, where instead of averaging the 12 months as a normal average, we used a weighted average based on irrigation water consumption in order to provide an average that would actually represent better an annual value to use if you know that you are irrigating. So this is often a concept that misunderstood. The aware agri and non-agri, they are the same methodology, they're the same characterization factor at the native scales. It's just the aggregation that is different in order to represent more an irrigation activity versus a non-irrigation activity. And it was important to do that because irrigation is such a large contributor in water consumption and in water scarcity that it really makes a difference, at least if you don't know which month you're consuming water, just to know is it for an irrigation activity or not. And then we can use the data that we know about how much water is consumed for which activity in which month and in which location to provide with an average that is more representative of your potential water consumption. Don't hesitate to still ask questions about this after. I know I normally have to explain it a couple of times. Uh, and the same concepts actually apply to um, providing averages at the national level. So if we want to provide a country level characterization factor, we also have to provide uh, an average of all the different watersheds. And this is not a simple average. In this case, there would be no simple average, but it's also not an area-based average, which would be perhaps the first representation that would come to mind when you look at, let's say we look at Canada here, then you would sort of mentally do an average of these different colors and, and extract what value you may think of. But actually the averages that we have created at the country level 
are also uh, weighted averages based on consumption. And hence, they will really represent the area where water is the most consumed. So this is to give you an idea of how important it is to take the monthly scale. Uh, these are different watersheds around the world, um, uh, quite some known ones, which have different patterns. Some of them, sure, like the Nile, will really stay at the maximum value all year round. There's really a few in this, uh, in this situation. Then you have some, like the Columbia Basin or the Danube, that will stay at the lowest range all year round. But most of them, actually we'll see strong fluctuation because in reality, water issues are quite binary. Either there is a water issue or there is not, and it's quite seasonal. So this is actually a bit of additional information about the amount of months where demand uh, is larger than availability around the world. That's also that's often a question that was asked because we have this cutoff, which doesn't allow us to uh, take into account um, the discrimination power that would come once the demand is larger than availability. This is in reality the amount of months where it happens in different regions of the world. This is to give you some example at the country level scale. So in order to make that a bit larger, uh, this is a non-agri uh, country level factors. So you see at the highest uh, scale we have Egypt, Uganda, Rwanda, Qatar, Kuwait, etc. And then at the lower scale, we have Costa Rica, Uruguay, Malaysia, Iceland, Norway, etc. So in terms of background data that we used, uh, we used the water gap model. So that was also part of some of the expert consultation we've done about which model to use and comparing the different uh, availability models. For water availability, we chose water gap because this model is the only one that is global, quite regionalized, and as well has been post-calibrated in order to match specifically some areas where they know that uh, there's not a good fit between what the model calculates and the reality, typically the arid regions. So water gap then post-calibrates it so that it matches um, the, the known data for water availability in these regions. And this was for us a strong reason to go with this model. And in this case, the model, the data that was provided to us was ranging from 1960 to 2010. So this is the 50-year uh, climate range and, uh, and it's average over these years. Then for the water use model, and here you have the publication that describes these two models. Um, we also went with water gap. It was the most consistent with the fact that we were using their hydrology model as well. And in this case, it represents uh, the economic and population data of 2010. So in order to interpret uh, aware, the cubic meter world equivalent refers to the location in the world where water is consumed on average, because as I mentioned, it's a consumption-based weighted average. So a factor of 10 in a specific region X would mean that there's 10 times less water in this region then in the world average location. If you remember, a uh, fraction is inverted. So a factor of 10 means that you have 10 times less water than in the world average location where water is consumed. And hence, a result of, for example, 50 cubic meter world equivalent, if that was the result of your water scarcity footprint in the same region X, would mean that this consumption of 5 cubic meter would be equivalent to consuming 50 cubic meter in the world average location. So the idea is really to bring back all the different water consumption to the same level, to the same denominator, so that they could be compared, simply based on how much water remaining there is per area in these regions. The tricky part comes sometimes when we have to interpret the aggregated values at the country level or at the annual level. Of course, we would always recommend to first uh, use as much as possible the watershed and the monthly scale, but if it's not possible, then some things to keep in mind when you interpret the larger values. Um, as I mentioned, the average, uh, let's say country or yearly value, does not represent a snapshot of the average, the visually average location. It may actually exclude uh, completely large regions where there is no or very low water consumption, which could be very different than where water is consumed. For example, 
most of the north of Canada would be excluded because there's very little water consumption occurring there, yet this is where there's also a lot of water. So this is not necessarily reflected in these averages. Uh, some countries with like deserts in the middle would not necessarily reflect this part because in the desert, very few people would be there to consume water. So this is something to keep in mind. Also, the fact that it's uh, strongly influenced by the agricultural water use if you use the unknown value or the agri value. Because I mentioned we did two averages, the non-agri and the agri. We also provided a third one if you really don't know your activity, typically to use in background databases. It's unknown, meaning that we really aggregated this based on all water consumption occurring in a region. And then, of course, irrigation is a big contributor to that. So what it does is that these averages really represent the regions where and when water is most consumed. And often, this would be in drier months and dry regions. So if the value doesn't look right, uh, it's really important to look closer. And to look closer means what? It means either looking at the monthly scale or at the watershed scale. And if you don't have the means to do both, then we have provided uh, information about in which region it's more relevant to do which one. So here in this map, the regions in blue actually show the largest spatial variation. So if you were consuming water in this region, it would be more important for you to go look at which watershed you're consuming in rather than which month. However, the region in green is the other way around. And in this case, the temporal variation is larger, and it's more important to look into which month you're consuming in than which specific watershed. So the main differences of uh, this methodology versus the previous ones is that this one is based really on a difference and not the fraction of availability versus demand. Uh, it also includes the aquatic ecosystem water requirements, and it ranges from 0 0.1 to 100, hence having three orders of magnitude of ranges of differences, which is a larger span, um, something to get used to, uh, as previously most methods had only two orders of magnitude. Also, the fact that um, it presents, uh, um, um, it relates the reference flow with the world average consumption. Hence, it's now has really the same concept as the carbon footprint with the reference flow. We have the world equivalent cubic meter being the reference. It's also the first time that we have different options, like having the country in annual scale um, weighted averages based on specific sector. At this point, we really only did the agri or non-agri as well as unknown. But we can also see that in the future, this could be done for different uh, sectors. It could be the energy sector, it could be the mining sector, for example, where providing these kind of averages really just help bridge the gap of data that is not there on the inventory side about the spatial and temporal regionalization. But again, I repeat, the factor is always the same. The human consumption and the, the human consumption considered in the development of the factor is always the same and it's always inclusive of all water consumption. It's really affecting only the way that it's aggregated to reflect better the uh, probability of your water consumption occurring in one region or not. And of course, it was the outcome of an international consensus building process of over more than three years in the end, including more than 75 experts input. You can download the characterization factors online on the WUCA webpage. You have them uh, on Excel uh, for country level, uh, monthly and annual, and you also have uh, a Google Earth layer to be able to click and see on the watershed level. Um, and then if you really wanted a shape file, I could send that over to you. In terms of implementation, um, I know it's implemented in Sima Pro at the, at the country scale. And in OpenLCA, they have done uh, an implementation, which is really handy because you can really select any regions that you want. And the software, OpenLCA, would calculate your aware factor with the consumption weighted averages for the region that you're drawing. So you could select a specific state in the US. You could select a mix of two regions within two countries, basically any shape you want. And the software will calculate the aware factor based on the native factors, but 
with the consumption weighted average for this region. And then I'm pretty sure it's integrated in Gabi, but I'm not sure of the regionalization. Um, last time I saw it was global, but it may have changed since then. So I'd like to thank uh, the sponsors who contributed to funding um, the development of this work, mostly through my time. And uh, I'd like to thank you, and I'm ready to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Anne-Marie. That was fascinating. We actually have a pile of questions. I saw that. <laughs> yeah, you did say it. Uh, oh, there are lots coming direct, too. So I've tried to group them a little bit. Um, and let's go ahead and start. I think there, we had some interesting ones around the overall process in building consensus and in your stakeholder process. Um, one of the questions we had just off the bat is, is the process still ongoing? Is there an ongoing process to find a consensus to properly address water degradation? That's a very good question. So the, the process for water scarcity is no longer ongoing. Uh, in terms of water degradation, there's, uh, so let's say if we think about the four categories, tox, ecotox, eutrophication, acidification. Um, in my view, for tox and ecotox, new stocks was already the result of a consensus building process, also uh, with a similar, actually was sort of the, the big brother group that started before us in life cycle initiative. So new stocks was the result uh, of this work for uh, toxicity and human toxicity. But, um, there could be in phase two of the flagship project, uh, now they have taken up four or five uh, additional categories. I don't have them on top of my hand, but I know eutrophication and acidification is part of them. So this would actually um, complete the degradation aspects of, of water use in order to have a complete profile and consensus of all of them. It's not impossible that they're also touching a little bit on toxicity again, but uh, I would have to go with that. Great, thank you very much. Um, a couple questions around the stakeholders themselves. Um, you mentioned that there was a stakeholder survey, and who was that directed to? Who was surveyed? And how were other stakeholder voices, particularly on a regional level, included in the development of the consensus? So we tried to reach as broadly as we could. We put announcement, whether it was on LinkedIn, through a distribution list, to recently build a list of stakeholders that we could email with questions when we had them. Um, this was for the, the survey part. For the workshop parts, um, it was the same. We organized the three workshops, often in margin of conferences. And we went as broadly as we could. Of course, it was easier to reach the RCA community because we're most connected with them. So we had to do special efforts to reach the hydrological community. So we went, for example, the water gap experts, as they were hydrological experts, and we're using the model to be included. And since we did these workshops on the three different continents, uh, we hope that this was helping the fact to have regional representation as much as possible, as well as from the attendees of, of the conference. Of course, sometimes we can have a lot of people that uh, are interested, but in terms of making it through a workshop or answering the surveys, um, we had, as I mentioned, about 35, uh, I believe, that answered the surveys, and then for the workshops, then it was about 75, so 25, the three of them. Um, so it was really an open call. It was no, there was no um, filtering, if you want. Most of the representation was a mix of consultant, academic, industrials. Um, we had some NGOs as well, and um, yeah, and a few governmental representatives. Okay, thanks. Um, a couple questions around um, availability and uh, irrigation. First was, does AWARE include or integrate the seasonal availability? or the seasonal demand by ecosystem? Do we discuss the monthly and annual? Yes, well, um, we consider monthly as being even a finer resolution than seasonal. But it, it, that applies also to environmental water requirements. So the method we choose, which is from Pastore Al in 2013, uh, is the variable monthly flow. So it does take into account the change in ecosystem water requirement month to month based on uh, the specific type of ecosystem and whether it's a high flow or low flow period. The range uh, goes from 30 to 60% of the natural availability that should be reserved for ecosystem based on uh, the month, so hence the, uh, the type of flow and the type of, uh, of season um, of the specific ecosystem. Okay, thank you very much. 
Um, so I think you said that water availability was, quote, renewable availability. If the major source of non-renewable water then would be mined groundwater in that case, is that correct? And if so, how do you use non-renewable resources? How can they be incorporated in the water scarcity footprint? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. So it's not integrated into, in terms of availability um, in the indicator. That doesn't mean that you cannot assess water consumption that is fossil groundwater with this water scarcity. It just means that we don't consider that the fossil groundwater was water that is available in the region for all the users and that you're depriving other users. No, actually, no, it's not even that. It's, that. it's not considered a renewable resource that is present. So you're actually tapping on resources that are not renewable. And if you're doing this, probably it's because it's, uh, the renewable availability is quite limited. Um, so you could assess water scarcity in this way at this point. However, um, there's a new working group that started last year uh, that assess, I don't know if you, if you notice in the, in the diagram, I always focused on the endpoint, human health and ecosystem. So actually, because there was quite a lot of debate on how to assess the resource depletion aspect of water consumption. And um, this working group started, so it's, it's a WUCA sub-working group, on how we could address this. And, and the, one, the one obvious uh, player to put in there is the fossil groundwater, which is a resource depletion, um, more oriented topic, rather than a water scarcity in terms of renewable water. Also for the reason that fossil groundwater uh, is not available to ecosystem uh, most of the time, and uh, only to selected human users which can really go and access it. So it wouldn't be wrong in my view to assess it at this point with a water scarcity index just because using this probably means that there's no water scarcity so you could take into account the fact that um, you're in a region that has low availability but this will really be in my view a proxy before we can have water depletion indicators specifically for fossil groundwater. Okay. And is there work ongoing to go after those indicators? Yes, exactly. So now the, um, the, we're finishing the first phase in this subgroup, which is the, the framework on how to assess uh, resource depletion related to water. So fossil groundwater will be included, but then there's also um, other concepts that we may want to, to include when we think about um, water depletion as a resource and not only as something useful uh, for human and ecosystem right now. So we're a bit demystifying all of this. Um, the framework, it's a paper which should be submitted this year um, and, and will set uh, the table really for the development of indicators that would match this framework. Thank you, and thank you for that use of demystifying. I think that's an excellent application. <laughs> um, we had a, a question actually related to irrigation, and that's, is the distinction between aware agri and aware non-agri is largely related to irrigation. What do you suggest for agricultural areas that do not themselves have irrigation? In that case, should just aware non-agri be used? Well, you're using an aware factor when you want to characterize a specific water consumption. So it's really about what use this water consumption was done for. Um, again, and the in the ideal case, you don't even need to choose between the two of them because you would know which month uh, and, and which watershed. If you don't know that and you need to choose an average because um, you don't have the regionalized or temporalized data, then you just choose agri or non agri based on, on the use of this water. So if it's an, if it's an agricultural use, I, in my view, it would be for irrigation unless there's uh, maybe the person could specify is it because it's for uh, livestock. Uh, drinking requirement or because it's really about whether it was used for irrigation or not irrigation. If it's not for irrigation, then it wouldn't be an agricultural area, if I understand correctly. Okay. Um, I think the question is largely that some, ir some agriculture is not irrigated. Um, or oh, yeah. It may not oh, right, right. Water. But then but then you don't use a where right. uh, okay. because it's not the it's not the blue water, yeah, maybe I didn't specify that, it's not the blue water consumption. So you, you don't use a, a water scarcity index to assess uh, just the rainfall used by the plants for green water. 
Great, thank you. And we've got a, actually quite a few questions around regionalization and data, so let's uh, move on to that group. Um, and actually, there's kind of an overarching one, and that was that as part of the process, you guys did, there were several case studies to test the applicability overall. What was your experience in terms of the availability of the regionalized data to properly reflect that for any specific process or product in LCA? Um, and is there, how, how limited is the availability of data on that scale or on the watershed level? And then what does that, what are the implications of that limitation? That's a very good question. Um, most of the case studies I, I was involved with at a, at a far level, uh, I'm not the one that actually performed most of these case studies. Um, I know um, my colleagues often perform uh, water footprints and use, I think at best, once available country country scale data. Um, of course, going smaller than country scale, it's difficult. You have to do it um, by hand in the foreground. Uh, but the background is mostly, if you're lucky, country scale or even global scale at this point. The idea is that you can uh, identify yourself, what are the, the processes that contribute the most, and then go and at least regionalize these ones. Um, the global values that is integrated um, is, the, is the global average, which in general we don't recommend to use, but has a value of um, 20, 23 for non-agri and 43 for agri. And then 42 is the just global global average. And then this is used in the background when the data is not there. Um, I think there's a global increase of data becoming available, whether it's readily or whether you have to do it manually. But of course, this is probably uh, right now a bigger source of uncertainty when you apply this if you don't have the, the correct, at least country level uh, values. And that segues very nicely into the next question, which actually is about the availability of, of country level data and particularly data at the watershed level. So are there water availability factors for all US watersheds that you would be able to share? And then if we only have country level data for a country like the US, what kind of things can you learn from the results? So no, actually there's water availability data at the watershed some watershed level for the whole world at the scale of, of AWARE. Uh, this is the data that was provided by WaterGap, and it's actually already available on the WOCA website as well. I've put directly the data there that they provided us, um, and it's for the 11,000 watersheds in the world. Uh, this is the data that we have used. I know that for the US, there's actually even better data available, I think, through a USGS, for example, which we didn't use because it wouldn't have been consistent with data or lack of data in other parts of the world, or if we use water gap for the rest and then this one for the US, wouldn't have been consistent. But I think actually the US has quite good data for water availability. Um, so I would recommend, if it's just for the US, looking more into, uh, into your national data if that's what you want. But the data that was used for the model uh, at the watershed scale is available online. Great, thank you. I'm actually going to circle back because I have a couple of follow-up questions on the agricultural discussion. Mm -hmm. um, and the first was, do I understand correctly that only the blue water component of agriculture is included? And then if evaporation from some crops will be quite different than others, and that would affect the available water, how or is this taken into effect? Sorry, I didn't, I didn't hear what the separation for some crops? Um, some crops. Um, evaporate differently. So uh, evaporation, yes. Yeah, sorry about that. No, no problem. Um, yes, so it depends if you're talking about, you know, I guess, the data for the, for the inventory side. Um, there's, there's models that allow you to calculate that. Uh, there's crop WAC, for example, that's put forward by FAO that allows you to put the crop and the climatic data, and that would provide you guidance on the water that is consumed. Um, it could be about the amount of, uh, and, and that's just for the water requirements of the plant. Uh, it's about the water irrigation that you put in. Um, then, of course, you could use, for example, all the water that, that you're actually putting in, and then you may have to make an assumption about how much of that was taken up by the plant, evaporated version versus infiltrated. Um, so it really depends on your system. And this is where, if you have an agricultural system, you have to, to look a bit closer at, um, at this. In, 
in Equinvent, for example, you already have some uh, inventory data for consumption of different, different crops. But if this is an important contributor of your system, it's good to go check and to make sure that it represents well. Uh, normally, it's really about yeah, the amount of irrigation based on, on your climate, based on, uh, on the plant. And of course, of the, of the rain that, that's falling, but this is not, so you are correct that this is not applied to, to the rainfall. It's really applied to the blue water. So normally it's about a human intervention. So the easiest way would be to really check how much water are you putting into your system via irrigation and then make hypotheses about how much of that is, is evaporated. Okay, and that actually is, is very complementary to the other follow-up, which is again about the handling of blue, gray, or green water. And I think you're saying that AWARE examines water scarcity directly only through the blue water availability and demand. And is it then correct that gray and green water availability and demand are incorporated directly by lowering the blue water demand according to the amount of gray or green water used? That is, gray or green water affects the AWARE metric but does, doesn't directly contribute. Well, I'll start with gray water because gray water is not actually a water. It's, it's a concept that is created a bit like uh, the, the first impact assessment method for water quality with the dilution volume of hypothetical water that would be required to dilute pollution. So you, you don't assess, in this case, the scarcity of gray water or, or things like that. Um, the whole um, quality, water quality component is really taken into account into the specific indicators where we model the problems uh, on ecosystem or on human health of, of the four main categories. So you don't, uh, yeah, there's no gray water to be preserved or to be minimized in this case. It's really just a way to, uh, to assess potential, uh, let's say, impacts or potential damages of, of pollution in a different way, in a critical way similarly to the critical volume uh, method. And in terms of green water, in LCA, um, the, the elementary flow that is being used, in this case, is assessed to be the land part on which the water falls, because the rain water is only usable if you are at the point where it falls for the rain. Um, I mean, not talking about collecting it and then shipping it, but it's really a, prop a property of the land use. So the rainwater that goes with it is really assessed more towards a land use perspective in LCA. And here it's really just about the blue water scarcity, about the ones that humans can appropriate themselves and can use it for their different needs. Uh, green water can really only be used for agricultural purposes and because you are using this specific piece of land. Okay, thank you very much. And I would encourage everyone who is, is still um, has follow-up questions on that to email them to uh, us as our shift or directly to, to Anne-Marie, who I'm sure will be happy to continue the, the conversation. I hope that's true, Anne-Marie. I just did it to you. <laughs> um, so I want to go on to a couple of questions around modeling, particularly, and structure. One of, the, one of the big ones here is that, as far as I understand, the characterization factors of AWARE the ability minus demand, the AMD, is set in relation to the average of the AMD world. So can that be also interpreted as a normalization step, as an optional element in LCA? This question is fundamentally about double counting. Um, mm -hmm. This person wants to include a normalization step in their LCA concerning water, water scarcity as well. Yeah, it's, um, it's more sort of an uh, in-house normalization within the characterization factor which in my view would not affect the fact that you could uh, do normalization after that on your C results based on um, average consumption of water per capita in an area, for example. Um, it's really making it in relation to uh, a reference flow. And, and yes, it is quite similar to, to a normalization, but in my view, it wouldn't be an issue of double counting with uh, a subsequent step of normalization as you do in ST before you do weighting if you wish to do that. Okay, thank you. And then how does the AWARE tool compare to other water footprinting tools in meeting the ISO requirements? Um, so the, the AWARE indicator, I guess. Um, yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, no, no problem. Um, because I was thinking, do we have a tool? I guess, yeah, with the Google Earth layer could be a tool. And, um, yes, well, ISO, uh, sorry, AWARE was developed in order to make sure that uh, ISO requirements were met. So the... Um, the definition of water scarcity in ISO is, on top of my head, 
the extent to which uh, availability compared to uh, demand, or the extent to which water demand compares to availability in a region. So in this case, it doesn't matter whether the compare is being a fraction or a difference. And, um, so, and, and it's a water scarcity index, and it was really designed to meet the requirement for water scarcity. For Great, thank you very much. There's actually, maybe I can add to that also, there's a, there's a 14073 document of ISO, which is a series of examples of application of 14046, the water footprint standard. And in there, there are several uh, examples that actually use the Great, thank you very much for that. Um, a really interesting question. Um, in, on the interpretation side, and that's, is it fair to simply relate much of what you're describing here to purchasing power parity for country-level economic buying power differences? That is, is consuming five cubic meters of water in one country like consuming 50 cubic meter of water in water average equivalents? Just to say, basically, it's analogous idea to purchasing power parity. Is that a reasonable analogy? Mm. I'm not sure. I'm not sure I understand well the question and in which kind of analogy we would want to relate this. It's really, in this case, it's really relating um, a consumption that would be equivalent to a global consumption based on what is available uh, physically. So I, I, I wouldn't want to slip into an economical um, aspect here. Uh, some economical aspects are integrated into the models at the endpoint for human health, for example. Not at this level, but that might not be the question. Um, I think that uh, that actually does pick it up. Okay. Uh, thank you. Also, aware factors themselves range from negative 100 to 100, right? And no. No, just from <laughs> 0.1 to 100. That's correct. Okay. Um, is that implemented in the World Impact Plus as meters cube deprived, which runs from a different range? Uh, in Impact World Plus, uh, mm -hmm. yes, AWARE is implemented at the midpoint, and it's also from 0.1 to 100. Um, however, there's different ranges at the endpoint. So perhaps this is what is um, pointed towards in terms of uh, human health impact of water scarcity. Uh, then it's a previous model that I developed in my PhD that was integrated uh, for deprivation of human users, uh, specifically from water consumption, namely there for domestic users and agricultural users. And this has broader range and it's in valleys uh, per meter consumed. So perhaps this is what um, the person is referring to because otherwise it's, uh, it's technically aware from 0.1 to 100 that's integrated at the midpoint. Okay. Thank you. We've got time for one closing question and comment. Um, if we haven't gotten your, your question, I will compile those and send them over to Anne Marie to see if she can provide some responses to those and we'll try and include them in the comments. Um, I'd like to, I think, Anne Marie, ask you to leave us with some of the, the thoughts on future steps, particularly from did anything emerge in the consensus building process around um, where we might go next in particular research avenues? Sure. Um, in terms of the water scarcity aspects, well, there was some subsequent steps following AWARE. Uh, some work that was presented already in the conference, which relates to developing non-marginal factors for AWARE. So I didn't go into this, but these factors are developed just like in LCA to be used for marginal water consumption, so not changing the whole water balance of the watershed. Um, however, if we want to assess large water consumption, like all domestic uh, water consumption of an entire country, then we would no longer be in the marginal and it would be good to develop factors for that, which we, we are working on and we have presented, but it's not yet, um, not yet published. As well, I would think it would be very interesting to develop different regionalization of these models, as I mentioned, either for like um, provinces, countries or different regions, but as well sectors. And now we have irrigation, non-irrigation, but even for the irrigation one, we could subdivide it by crops so that people, users, don't have to actually go and look up exactly the month and the location for the specific crops, but the aggregation could provide this information for them. Um, also, future scenarios would be very interesting, but for that we would need more data on future scenarios of availability and consumption, which of course has quite some uh, uncertainty with that. 
but um, I would still love to have this data to be able to make these projections. So there we and go, then, we have our walking stats. <laughs> right, and I can just maybe conclude also for the, for the endpoints, so I talked a bit about the resources, but there's also quite some work um, for the ecosystem category where we're pretty much just building a framework on how to really do a multi-compartmental assessment of consuming water in one department, one compartment, one region, how would it affect all the different other compartments and eventually modeling how impacts from this change of water availability in all the potential ecological compartments uh, can be linked to damages. I think that's a really long pathway of work. It's the, it's the right way to go, but I think it's a, it's a long way. That's fantastic. Thank you ever so much, Marie. This has been a, a wonderful talk, and I think I can tell from the comments, and, and both public and, and private, everyone's very grateful and, and very excited about the work that's come out. Thank you so much for sharing it. Um, great. That's You're welcome. Thanks. It's great. Thanks um, for joining us. Our next webinar will be the 15th of March, and we will have Gwen Davidow from the World Environment Center, who will talk about State Department and the RED program that supported entrepreneurship and supports entrepreneurship, innovation, and sustainability in Central America, the Dominican Republic, contributing to sustainable growth. So please everyone join me in thanking Anne-Marie, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye.